This is a Leo Bodner BBI32 bit box. It's basically a joystick controller with 32 buttons on and no, ac no analog axes. And today I'm just trying it out for the first time to see if it works as I expect it to work. So I'm going to try a couple of different kinds of switches. I'm going to try a base, just basic uh, toggle switch. Then I want to try one of the encoder switches. I, I need to understand how they're going to work. Um, I've also got one of the other controllers, the um, joystick controller that includes the analog axes. I might dig that one out as well and try a potentiometer on there. I've got a toggle switch at the moment just wired up to the multimeter uh, just to check that the switch works like I expect. It seems to. That's a continuity tester. Hopefully you can hear that beep. Uh, let me just hold that up. Uh, that's on obviously and then it's hard to do that with one hand. So that's just to, just to ensure the switch works like I expected to. I mean there's nothing uh, particularly complex about a toggle switch. That's a single pole, single throw, SPST toggle switch. It's actually rated for 3, three amps at 125 volts AC. Anyway, we're not using AC, we're using DC. Very small voltages, so we're not bothered about that. So we're looking at the BBI32. Here it is, a uh, handy USB lead. Going to plug it in. Hopefully they can hear that connect. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use some handy paper clips just to um, get me connected. I'm going to just connect up one of the switches, switch one. And we put croc clips on there. And then what will we do? We'll link that up to the switch. So what we're looking at here is control panel. This is not my FSX PC. This is the uh, just my desktop PC. You'll see over here we've got the BBI 32s come up as a thing called button box. If we right click and do game controller settings on that, we will get button box interface. If we go properties, we get a test page. So what we should see is button one toggling with the toggle switch. And indeed we do see that. Button one is right here. Hopefully that's showing up. So that's working just as we expect. So next up is uh, I think we'll do an encoder switch. Alright this time we've got a rotary encoder switch. Um, here it is. Can you see that? Just about. This is a simple encoder. It has it basically does the function of two switches, left and right. The slightly more complex ones, which I have got on many of the panels, you've got a left and right and a, and a push switch in the middle. That, I don't have one of those to hand, but uh, now what we have to do here is slightly more complex. We need three paper clips plugged into button one and button two of the controller and they have a common ground. So if you connect to one ground you're connected to all the grounds. hope that makes sense. Another thing we have to do here, we need to run the BBI32 interface program. This sets up the behaviour of the controller appropriately for the type of encoder switch we've plugged in. We've plugged in the one I was just showing you, the basic two-way controller to recognise that. I don't know what I'm doing with this program to be honest but I've figured it out and uh, what we've got here basically we, we're looking at pairs of inputs so each rotary controller you plug in basically occupies at least one pair of button inputs what's that? The multimeter going mad so as I've just demonstrated I've plugged this encoder into the B1 and B2 inputs so I need to go and set that up they're all set initially to off so I've set this to 1 to 1 that seems to be the right setting and if I go back into my properties page for the BBI what I should find is when I click it right I get button 1 and when I click it left I get button 2 so I'm going left 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 and each left click single click of the encoder switch gives me a single pulse on the button and I'm going right and a single click gives me a 
uh, very reliably and they're one to one and I'm spinning it really quickly and I'm not getting any glitchy and I'm not getting any spurious opposite direction pulses this is obviously a high quality encoder switch in contrast to some of the crappy switches you get on things like the Cytec boards so that seems fairly straightforward let me just go back and see if I set that to 1 to 2 see if this behaves like I imagine it it will yeah basically 1 to 2 just divides it so you have to go 2 clicks between pulses so we don't want that in normal operation we want 1 to 1 so we're back again this time we've got the big daddy board this one is the BU0836X controller board. You'll see it's bigger. Hopefully, you, I hope you can see it's bigger. And that's because, yeah, here along here we've got analog axes as well as all the button connectors. Other than that, it's all the same. Push fit, hopefully. So Windows can see it. It's come up on the game controller's interface. All right, this time we've got the controller wired up with a potentiometer. Handling this very gingerly because the connectors are very small, the crocodile clips are very close together, so I just don't want to disturb that. This is a, I believe this is a 10K linear potentiometer. So we're going to use this for a, a volume control for my ATC comms and also for the rudder trim. So what I've done is I've plugged this in again using three paper clips for each axis, this is the x-axis, we've got a ground plus five volts and a center tap, I think that's called. So there it is, not very dramatic. That's the x-axis. You might, hopefully you can see that wandering left and right there. There is another program that comes with the Bodna board which if I flip to that this is an interesting program, it shows you all the controllers plugged in. I've got a Logitech joystick plugged in as well, so you can see as I move that, it's uh, that's quite a nice program really. It's giving you all the raw data and so on. It's, but it's this one down at the bottom left that we're interested in. This is our axis. Rotate the potentiometer, we're getting uh, the values displayed here for the x axis. And you can see currently displayed, if you can read that, the output value is zero. If I go all the way to maximum we've got 64k more or less. So we're basically putting on a variable resistor, we're putting plus 5 volts on one end, zero on the other end, tapping off somewhere along there and that voltage is being put through an analog to digital converter with a resolution of 12 bits. So that should give us a value in the range not to 4096, that's 2 to the power of 12, but actually we're getting reported 64 not to 64k so that's obviously scaled that value um, if I have to show you that in the Windows control panel there is an option to look at raw data so we're seeing a true value there we're going from naught with the pot all the way to the left to 4091 in fact so we're not getting quite 4096 but uh, that's obviously trying to display the, the raw 12 bit value so that all seems fairly straightforward and I think we've pretty much got the hang of that. The hardest bit's going to be, you know, using devices like this little potentiometer. So it's impossible to see that, but those um, little tags on there, they're really close together. So it's going to be getting those soldered up. You know, that's going to be the hard part of working with this, plugging it into the board and then getting the software set up that's going to be the easy part. So there we go the next thing I'm going to do basically is to contrive some sort of mounting plate or enclosure to put these boards in. So we've just got the basics of the electronics mounted and that's here on the side. We've got the Electronics are going to be mounted on the side here. These are the Bodner boards. By the way, don't get compl I've said this before, don't get complacent. There's always something goes wrong. There's always a problem. Uh, the problem in this case 
these boards don't all have the same size mounting holes which is a pain in the backside. The little ones, the BBI 32s, have the regular 3mm mounting holes. Not so the older board, the one with the analog, I forget the number, but the one with the analog inputs. <coughs> that's got some slightly smaller holes. That almost defeated me, but being the nerd I am, I've saved every leftover screw from every computer I've ever built. So anyway, after a bit of scrubbing around, I found a motley collection of hardware that served the purpose. Doesn't look great, but uh, does the job. So the idea here is these are uh, mounted at uh, more or less working height, so it's going to be easy, or it's going to be less arduous, shall we say, to wire them up. It's also on the side facing the window. <laughs> it's a bit of forward planning there. And we've got USB leads will exit up through these holes in the top onto a hub at the top of the structure there. These holes at the right are for the wires to come, or wire bundles to come in from the panels. I've got a space here for a fifth board which I think I'm going to need so I've put the hardware in and as you'll see that's nicely enclosed using this uh, plastic whatever it is lunch box or bit box that I just picked up at uh, home base for like 5 99 something like that. Well in the spirit of disasters and things going wrong uh, just just realized that when I was cutting these holes for the USB leads uh, I didn't measure carefully enough uh, basically the USB lead is 10 centimeters 10 millimeters square so what did I do? I drilled a 13 millimeter hole for each lead, losing sight of the fact that the diagonal is actually bigger. It's about 15 millimeters, so they don't fit in a nutshell. They don't fit. They don't even fit very tightly. So <laughs> I've got to re-drill all those holes. So there you go. Measure twice, cut once. That's what they say.